thank you everyone for coming. I'm Lars Albertson. I've been working the last two and a half, three years or so as a freelance consultant, helping companies getting value out of their data. In that process, I've learned a bit about the sort of dynamics of, of data science and data scientists, and I'd like to share some of my uh, insights or observations. And I, uh, I decided to put a provocative title here because I know quite a few of you have data science teams. We just heard Ika has one. Uh, how many others have a data science team in house? A handful of you. Don't worry, um, I'm hoping to inspire you to make even better use of your data scientist. So uh, we are experiencing some, some kind of industrial revolution, just like the electricity or and the internet and so forth. And no matter who we are, we need to relate to it, whether we want to be on the front end or we want to relax for a while and see, uh, see how the, the others are doing. Um, and in that revolution, these the whole bunch of buzzwords pop up, and uh, we would like to get try them out and see if they if they can change our businesses and how we can get value from them. And uh, the discussion usually looks something like this. Uh, and the next step is very often that a bunch of money gets allocated, and we hire data si some data scientists. They need to work with something, so we carve out some data from our systems and uh, let them work with that in the lab. This is a, a recurring pattern uh, that I've seen in, in several organizations, and it tends uh, not to give the expected results usually. Usually uh, people have very high expectations <coughs> on the results of this. And what it typically does result in is some kind of proof of value. Yes, there is value or there is no value in the data that we gave them. Uh, and that's a great first step. It, in some cases, it can result in like proof of concepts or, or prototypes. Um, it usually does not result in any uh, valuable products, and it uh, definitely does not result in return on investment. Um, and I hope to explain why. So. Uh, we were hoping for, for, for great results. What, where, what went wrong? Uh, we hired the data scientists and we asked them these data science questions about deep learning and analytics and all the sorts of things that data scientists do. Uh, and they were, seemed really good at these things. Now, when they came to work, it turns out that they were experiencing very different challenges. And perhaps we should, instead of ask them how to get data from very busy people, or how to maintain Hadoop clusters, or how to handle cloud infrastructure, or uh, persuade people to give access to the data. It turns out that very often the data scientists are not great at these things, and they're also not particularly happy at doing these things. So what's missing? This is a picture that uh, Google uh, produced a few years ago in an academic paper. And Google has been doing more machine learning products than ever anybody else. The uh, machine learning boxes in the middle there, the dark one, the darkness of the boxes uh, represent the complexity of the code. The size of the boxes represent the relative effort that they put into machine learning products. And this is some kind of average over all of their product, all of their machine learning products. So as you see, in addition to machine learning, there are lots of more mundane, more or less mundane things that need to be done in order to form a product. The bit in the middle is the data science. That's where the data scientists are experts. So if you form a data science team and not much else, what you're building is the little thing in the middle which is far from a product. Here's another picture uh, that illustrates the, uh, the uh, context and relations. Um, this is by Monica Rogatti. She did data science at LinkedIn for a long time. And this picture basically says that in order to do the, the sort of uh, fancy uh, deep learning things that we see in the media, 
you first need to have a baseline or more uh, more basic machine learning and master that and have a solid foundation there. And in order to do that, you need to have a foundation of, of obtaining understanding and value from your from your data. And in order to have the get the understanding from your data, you need to be able to clean your data and to make it of high quality. In order to do that, you need to have a foundation of, of infrastructure being able to process data in a scalable manner. And in order to do that, you need to have a, the collection in place. And that all of the layers above are dependent on you having experience and a foundation in the layers below. And the data science is up there. So if you only have a data science team, you're you are asking them to do this floating thing without the foundation. Now, it is possible to just do the minimal piece of foundation necessary to build some AI products. There are success stories floating about that look something like this. Um, and these success stories tend to be very widespread because people uh, generally want to speak about their successes. Uh, this can work, but it's hard to repeat these things. It's hard to do them more than once or twice. Also, uh, making machine learning products is fairly difficult. It's particularly difficult on the top. Very few companies today have effective deep learning products in, in place. And there is actually a lot more business value down there on the simple things, but it doesn't give you media attention. So what does make sense is to start from the bottom and go for the low-hanging fruit. And it turns out that there are lots and lots of potential and value in in uh, getting solid data processing in place to do very ordinary mundane things like reporting, risk assessment, master data management, and so forth. The things that you already, on a business level, know how to do, but to, to apply modern data engineering tools to do them efficiently. So, what about the data scientists? What do they need? Uh, to be uh, to be efficient, they need a foundation. W what is needed in the foundation? If we go back to the Google picture again, the things that you definitely need in order to do efficient machine learning and data science is data engineering. That's the plumbing, the uh, the data processing, and the uh, sorting out what data is what, and so forth. You also need domain expertise, subject, ma subject matter expertise, uh, at least if you have a non-trivial, um, if you're working in a non-trivial domain. Uh, so for example, if you're working on image processing in the manufacturing process, you need the skills to know what images uh, um, are indications of something wrong in the process and what's the normal deviations. You will need some kind of product management or product ownership to connect the, the uh, data science and the machine learning that you do to business needs. And also, uh, obtaining quality in machine learning products is difficult, and has, so you'll need a, some kind of non-trivial quality assurance engineering. If you go to mature machine learning products, it sort of looks like this, has some more things. Uh, only if you're doing complicated machine learning products, you actually need comp complex data science. And you also need to uh, do some front-end engineering if you're doing user-facing products so that you can measure the effects of your machine learning. If you're throwing out new recommendations, you need to f measure whether they are actually better or worse. Uh, machine learning products in practice are also very op operations heavy, so you need what's called a data ops and a team that's in, or individuals that is interested in doing these things. Most data-driven products look so, something like this. They don't have the machine learning part, and this is the mundane things, the reporting, the risk assessment, and so forth. This is where most of the value lies in having a, having a data platform and doing big data. But we want to get up there. 
uh, there is value up there as well, for sure. So how do we get there? Uh, most systems or most companies out there have something that looks like this. Um, the business logic is split into microservices and the data is split out and uh, all of these microservices sort of have their own databases. Some, some data is gathered into data warehouse and so forth. This is usually not a uh, technical uh, decision. It's rather uh, Conway's law. The, tec the technical structure reflects the uh, company organization. So the microservices are built around, uh, around a team and they're owned by a team. And the team, different teams own, di own different parts of the data. In order to do something interesting and some innovation with data, if you have an idea that requires data from multiple teams, you need to go and talk to all of these teams. And these teams, they need to be enthusiastic to your idea. Uh, they, they need to prioritize you. They, the data they have need to be useful for what you're doing. They preferably need some history and, and it needs to have good quality and so forth. Overall, going around to all of these teams and ensuring these things adds a lot of friction to the innovation process, which means that you will spend little time doing actually value adding things and a lot of time doing uh, wasteful things like waiting for people, bureaucracy, and so forth. So then one day this big data paradigm came along and it's not so much a technolo technological invention, even though it was sort of enabled by things like Hadoop. It's more a, an, a new way of collaborating. Instead of going to all of the individual teams, you ask them to put their data in a data lake or in a, in a stream processing framework. So the first time you go around and build a, pro uh, build a data driven product, if, if the data lake is empty, you have all of the same friction. But you ask all of the teams to put their data that you need in a lake, and then you build what's called a data pipeline to refine the raw data and to turn it into, into something that's useful for you. With time, as more data and as the lake, this friction decreases. That's one of the main benefits of, of having a data platform or a data link. Now, this is great. Uh, and this is why so many companies nowadays have a, have a da data platform. What about the data scientists? How do they, do they come in in this picture? Well, if you make a team and you put them in the lab and you give them some data, they can do experiments on that data. They can only do that like once. If you don't give them new fresh data, they will essentially do overfitting. Overfitting is a, is a machine learning term that if you sort of train on the data over and over again, you will get some model that applies to that data in particular, but doesn't generalize to tomorrow's data. If you let a data scientist team work with the same data, they will come up with a solution that is overfitted to that data, but doesn't generalize until to tomorrow's data. Whereas if the data scientists work in the data platform on live, fresh, new data, they can, they can work with something that generalizes over time. And they can put new measurements out into the world to, to gather new data, and they can let users' behavior affect their models and adapt to the real world out there and do it and work iteratively, making better machine learning products. The speed here in the latency is from getting a new measurement out there to being able to use it in a data pipeline uh, is called data agility. And that varies a lot between companies. I've seen companies where, where the where, where the companies are organized in silos that don't talk to each other, and then there's no real upper limit on how much, how long this can, time can take. We did a measurement at a very agile company, but with autonomous teams, and it turned out that it took about a month to get a new measurement out in a mobile client and to get the data in a useful state in the lake. Um, there are companies, I've worked for one company where this is measured in days, 
this speed affects the work of the data scientists significantly. If this is fast, they can iterate quickly. In order to get to fast iterations, you need to put down both cultural work and organizational work as well as technical work for the coordination. This is way outside the scope of the data scientist team. Right? They, they cannot affect these things. But nevertheless affects their success significantly. So what do I do with my data scientists? My recommendation is put them out into production, put them near the real data, embed them in other teams so that they have the support of data engineering and subject matter experts close at hand. Don't put them in a corner in a lab and give them some data. Make, sit, place them close to production data. And perhaps that's what you're already doing, but I see some uh, companies not doing this. If you only remember a few things from this presentation, remember that machine learning is a team sport. You need all kinds of people to do it. And you need the data processing in order to, to iterate quickly and arrive at good products. And experiments and learnings can only be done in production, with production data. This turns out to be fairly, it's a lot wider scope and it's fairly difficult for many companies to do. Uh, so I've recently formed a startup uh, to do the these things as a service for companies. And we just signed our first customer, so wish us good luck. I'll end with some uh, quotes from my Twitter feed, just to uh, leave you there. Adam at the bottom there, he, he built up um, data science at Twitter. He's now at Mixpanel, head of data, head of machine learning and data science. Eric at the right bottom, he built up machine learning at Spotify. So the, uh, this one is sort of uh, just copied from Google. So that's their view. Um, these effort and value are I added myself. And this is a much more coarse like, uh, description of things. My point is that there is low hanging fruit at the bottom. right? You can get a lot of value from just collecting the data, getting, getting to work with pipelines and, and building a, a simple data platform and doing very simple things. That's, that is, requires a lot less effort than doing, building machine learning products. Be, building, if you build like reporting products or risk assessments or something that's sort of very ordinary, uh, little effort, lots of value. So, um, I hope that's understandable. I mean, the, um, there's a different scope here. This applies to machine learning products, specifically. Whereas this, these effort and value boxes, I refer to all types of products. So, the, the effort for non-machine learning products is much smaller than the efforts for machine learning products. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you very much.